This conference will now be recorded. All right, so let's go ahead and call our work session, or special meeting, sorry, our special meeting to order. Um, and we're going to do this the proper way, so we won't do roll call or the pledge. We'll save that for the actual regular uh, public meeting. Um, but let's go ahead and dive into new business because we only have 55 minutes. Uh, Alec, is that you? Uh, good evening. Um, actually, Ethan will be presenting on this topic tonight for the FEMA updates. Um, he is currently um, attending virtually. And then we also have Suzanne Sarpong, I believe that's how you say her last name, um, with FEMA, who um, actually provided these um, recommendations for us. For And she'll be available for any further question on that matter. So I'll hand it over to Ethan to discuss FEMA updates. Appreciate it. Welcome, Ethan. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear Sorry, me? Okay. Sorry, you. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we can hear you, Ethan. Okay. Um, yeah. So I am obviously attending remotely tonight. Um, I am on vacation in Whidbey Island, um, and as Alex said, I'll be presenting this item tonight. And then um, Suzanne Sarpong with FEMA Region Ten is here with us tonight, and um can also help answer um specific questions um and so the purpose of this item tonight which is new to you is um talking to you about map updates um flood insurance rate uh map panels that that fema uses to regulate development in special flood hazard areas. Um, FEMA is undertaking updates with those. And um, in addition, Suzanne was kind enough to review the center's ordinance and um, take a look and see what needs to be updated in that to be compliant with the National Flood Insurance Program standards. Um, and so we'll be talking with you tonight about some of those um, th th those two basic things and then um, more specifically about the code updates. Um, so in case you don't know what a FEMA firm panel is, that acronym FIRM stands for Flood Insurance Rate Map. Um, and those are the maps that FEMA uses to assess risk of uh, floods happening. Um, and typically those show, um, you know, two basic areas. One is the floodway, which is sort of the active channel of discharge of floods. Um, and then uh, it also shows flood plain areas, 100-year uh, flood plain areas, which are the areas where there's a 1% annual chance of uh, there being a flood. Um, and sometimes you'll also hear that referred to as the 100 year flood, um, you know, hence 1% in any one year, there'd be a 1% chance of a flood in those areas. Um, and so local jurisdictions also have a role to play in flood regulation. It's not just FEMA. Um, and so local jurisdictions are responsible for regulating frequently flooded areas or special flood hazard areas, which the center does through its critical areas ordinance in 18.300 of the La Center Municipal Code. Um, and so uh, typically when a development comes in or a development applicant comes in and proposes development in those areas, then they have to go through a process of obtaining a critical areas permit um, but also have to get a um, floodplain permit to develop in those areas. Um, so critical areas permits are administered by um, community development. Um, so those would be reviewed by, by myself and Brian and sometimes Tony, um, the city engineer. Um, and then um, building permits are overseen by um, John Wilson, the city's building administrator. And so he also has a role in approving um, floodplain permits. Um, okay, so that's kind of a little bit of a background on these 
map updates and the code updates that we're going to be talking about. Um, a little bit more background, um, the National Flood Insurance Program um, is a program that gives, you know, as the name suggests, flood insurance to homeowners and um, business owners and, and um, protects them against um, uh, or helps them recover from floods, you know, if there is one. Um, and so any homes and businesses in high risk flood hazard areas, which are typically the 100 year flood plain or, or higher risk than that, would have to have um, government and that have government backed mortgages are required to have flood insurance. There's not a lot of those areas in La Center. So the mapped flood hazard areas, um, which you can take a look at it on page seven of the agenda packet here, these are the new FEMA maps that, well, both the existing maps and then the, the new FEMA maps um, on page seven of the agenda packet, Jess, if you don't mind going there. Um, so there on the left is the existing um, flood hazard area there in pink along the East Fork of the Lewis River. Um, actually, sorry, the pink is the, the floodway and the blue is the 100 year flood plain. Um, and then on the right is the newly proposed maps by FEMA. And so essentially there'd be additional areas along uh, the lower reaches of Breezy Creek that would be included as um, regulated floodplain. Um, but uh, there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of existing development or structures within these areas, um, you know, so the center is lucky in the sense that it's not like a lot of communities where there's a lot of development, existing development in these areas, um, because a lot of the East Fork of the Lewis River is adjacent to the La Center bottomlands, bottomland wetlands where there isn't really any development and that's under um, preservation um, by the county. Um, most of the existing structures are there along um, adjacent to the East Fork of the Lewis River there, east, uh, excuse me, west of the bridge where there's some residential areas and some undeveloped land that will become residences um, in the future. And so even though the center has very few, very little development in these areas and there's, uh, you, you know, there might be the need to um, ensure um, homes and businesses in those areas in the future, although typically development's not usually allowed in those those areas if it's not there already. So, um, okay. So uh, another reason that we're coming to you tonight is that um, these new the new special flood the flood study for Clark County, the updated flood study for Clark County will become effective on November 2nd, 2023. And that's the date that the new maps will become effective as well. And so the city's obligated to update both its code and references to the, the flood hazard study um, by that time. And so the schedule then is a little bit accelerated because we're hoping to talk to you about this tonight in a workshop, which is what we're doing. And then Next month, we're hoping for a public hearing in front of planning commission and the following month, um, you know, assuming things go as planned would be a public hearing and adoption um, in front of the city council. We might need to have a workshop with the city council as well. Um, so before I sort of dive into some of the specific code updates that we're going to be talking to you about. Are there any questions about that? Um, and or is there anything that Suzanne you want to jump in on that I might have not covered or mischaracterized in any way? Okay. Yeah, Ethan, this is Dennis. Um, looking at this, the maps that you had up there, I was trying to, I was trying to understand the map in conjunction with the definitions. And I, I was having problems because we talked, there's a definition for a base flood, there's a flood plain, there's a floodway fringe, there's a special flood hazard area. And I, I 
guess maybe I'm confused or the we got too many definitions there, but if, I understand, if you're looking at the map, I understand that the, the dark brownish area is the floodway. And I assume that, well, I don't know what the blue area is. I understand the green areas are the, the uh, special hazard area, which is covered by the base flood, which is a hundred year flood. But what's the blue area? Um, Suzanne, you can jump in here as well, but I believe what the blue area is, is areas where there's a mapped um, flood elevation. So there's different types of flood hazard areas, some with mapped elevations and some with not. Did I kind of hit that right? Yes, exactly. The blue area is just simply the zone AE and the green area that we're seeing is going to be a zone A. Zone AE has a detailed study on base flood elevations provided as part of the study and the zone A does not have published base flood elevation data. Can you hear me okay? Am I not loud enough? Yeah, I guess, say that again, I didn't quite understand it. So the, the green area is what's new. So that's the, the inundation area for a hundred year flood, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Then what's the blue area? The same. It's already mapped, however, it's not new. Um, it might have changed a little bit from the old map to the new map, but it is also still inundation area of the base flood. In fact, all of this area is inundation of the base flood. The pink hatch area or the pink area is what we call floodway, uh, which is just a portion of the zone AE, um, but the whole blue area is considered a zone AE per the legend that's shown on this. And then the green area is zone A. Those are just different types of flood zones. Uh, the, the different characterization just defines whether or not we have base flood elevations as part of the data uh, published as part of the data for use by the community to use for compliance purposes and insurance purposes. So do I understand then that the zone A does not have that baseline data? The A does not have uh, published base flood elevation data. That's correct. So it's a flood hazard area, but we don't have published the base flood elevation data. So we may have some base flood elevation data, but it's not going to be part of the new study that's being adopted. And right. if we don't have it, I don't know for sure if we have it or not, but if we don't have it, um, there are other ways of determining what the base flood elevation might be in that area for compliance purposes. This is Dennis Hill. Uh, when you say, um, is this something that the state has to develop or is this something that the county develops? Who develops that uh, going along with that green area, that category A? Uh, it's not something the state has to develop or even La Center. It is just simply an area that FEMA has published as having a high risk of flooding during the 1% chance storm event. We just did not publish the elevations for that uh, flood hazard or, or for that flood event. So if uh -huh. a base flood elevation is a water surface elevation related to mean sea level, um, and for, I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, we are not publishing the elevation data for that water surface elevation for that area along Breezy Creek. I can certainly ask my map team why it is that we are making that a zone A and not a zone AE. Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I can certainly ask if you would like me to. Well, who is the we? Who is the? Maybe FEMA. So the. So you say we haven't done this, we haven't done that. Who's we, the we? FEMA. FEMA. <laughs> FEMA uh, hasn't published any data. Excuse me. Yes. FEMA has you. not published data. Yeah. But along the blue area, uh, along Lockwood Creek and along, um, is that the Lewis River you said? Uh, the blue area that you see on these maps is a zone AE, which means that area is also considered inundated by the 1% chance flood event at a high risk of flooding. And we actually do have published 
elevation, water surface elevations for um, those areas. And then the floodway is an area within the zone AE that is the channel plus adjacent land areas that are necessary to convey the discharge from that 1% flood event without cumulatively increasing the water surface elevation more than a foot. And, and that's what we were using as a standard for last center. So we're just saying this area has to be reserved as um, an area that we don't want anybody to encroach into, we meaning FEMA, uh, an area that should be reserved for passage of flood water only. So development is highly discouraged in the flood way. Uh, it's usually the areas of higher velocity, uh, higher da dangers from floating debris. And um, if there is any development within the floodway, there's a criteria that needs to be analyzed to ensure that any development within that area is not increasing the water surface elevation by any amount at all, because we've, we've already um, taken a flood plain, which is the blue area, and kind of squeezed it until we reached a certain height above base flood elevation and stopped squeezing and said, this area has to be reserved for water passage. And then all development can occur outside of the floodway without a problem with construction requirements in the high risk flood hazard areas to promote flood resiliency, such as elevation um, or foundation designs. But anything within the floodway itself um, is highly discouraged and very hard to do. And, and, the, and there's a high bar for that. We, we require zero rise in the flood way. And if it has to be developed like a bridge or a culvert, if it has to go in the flood way, then there are processes in place that can be done in order to accommodate those type of developments that have to be done in the floodway. I think I said that, my, I may have said that a little too quickly, but. I guess my, my concern is on the, the green area on Breezy Creek. Without data to yeah. support, it appears that someone is guessing at where that green area is. So uh, this new study, just based on what I'm looking at on the map, apparently the new map study did determine that there is a risk of flooding along Breezy Creek that previously was not mapped, was not shown as an area of high risk flood hazard. And on the new study, they are showing it as an area of high risk flood hazard. But the water surface elevations of the 1% chance flow are not being published Again, I don't know why, and I can ask my mapping team why it is that Breezy Creek is not going to be coming in as a zone AE as opposed to a zone A. The main point of I, a zone A, go ahead. I, I guess having walked up and down Breezy Creek many times, I'm surprised that any 100-year flood could get over the, the earthen dam that's in there. Um, and so I'm questioning, what, you know, I, I want to hear from your map team on how they come up with this and would be sure. curious if anybody's actually walked up there and looked at Breezy Creek because it's going to be quite a bit of, I think it's going to be a huge flood to get that far up Breezy Creek. Um, I understand. I, um, I know, or I believe anyway, prior to this whole process of ordinance adoption, uh, we did have public meetings did we not, Ethan, on the new maps that were coming out in Clark County? I think that there were quite a few uh, either public meetings or at least uh, presentations made by the map team prior to this yeah, point. This is Brian, uh, Public Works Director. I think the county largely led that effort, but they there was an extensive process. I can forward that around the Planning Commission members uh, just to sort of okay. build a background on this. But, um, yeah, this has been in the works at the county level for quite some time, and now it's kind of coming down to the city level to to adopt everything. Gotcha. And you know, specifically, Breezy Creek, you know, I think a lot of this is based on um, you know lidar data and topographic data, and then they compare that to the flood elevation. And if it's you know if the the land is lower than the the floodplain, then it's wet essentially. And just because there's an earthen dam there, there's a culvert through that, and so you know 
when water comes up, it can go back through that culvert and inundate that area too. So. So if you are able to go ahead and access those um, documents, I guess, from the Clark County public meetings or the mapping that uh, meetings that have been done. Um, but I will certainly make a note here. And if you still have questions, we can certainly uh, try to answer those questions more fully for Breezy Creek. Is that? I would appreciate that, yes. OK. Uh, somebody needs to send me an email to that effect, please, <laughs> so I can make sure it gets passed along directly. Thank you. I think Thank you. Jess, the city's permitting coordinator who's running the meeting here can probably coordinate that. Um, Jess, I just volunteered you, but is that would that be okay? Yeah, I already took notes. I'll, I'll take care of it. And Susan, okay. I'll reach out to you if there's further questions at that point. Okay. Um, any other questions before we kind of start talking about the characterize some of the characterizing some of the code updates that we're working on? I think we're good to go. Okay. Um, so as kind of outlined in the staff report here, there's a number of new definitions as well as amended definitions in the ordinance and those are there in those tables one and two of the staff report um, a lot of the changes actually probably the bulk of the changes to the critical areas ordinance regulating frequently flooded areas is in the definitions section um, and then moving on to section 183040, which are the um, the permitted and exempt uses section, which is the permitted and exempt uses section of the ordinance. Um, we're going to be amending that um, to first of all, if you look at table 183040 in the ordinance, what that does is outline a series of activities that are either permitted or exempt um, or not in the, um, in the frequently flooded area, which is also the equivalent to the special flood hazard area, by the way. And so there's kind of two different terms used there. The critical areas ordinance uses the um, term frequently flooded areas, um, but FEMA uses the term special flood hazard area. And so in both cases, we mean the 100 year flood plain. So anyways, there's a table in there that permits certain activities within critical areas. And um, that table we're proposing to amend probably to take out the column that deals with um, uh, frequently flooded areas, both for permitted and exempt activities. Um, and the reason is that FEMA, through the National Flood Insurance Program standards that were, the city is obligated to adopt into its ordinance, um, has uh, its own standards about what's permitted or not and how within 100-year um, floodplain areas or special flood hazard areas and within floodways. And so having a separate set of um, requirements or, or provisions, conflicting provisions in this case about what's permitted or exempt isn't really necessary. Um, and then throughout some other portions of the code, we'll be removing non-compliant provisions of the city's frequently flooded areas. Um, an example of that would be 183093 um, items K and L that allow development in the floodway that's really actually prohibited um, by the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, and then another example would be um, discussing responsibilities of the floodplain administrator, uh, what data they're supposed to keep. Um, and I lost track of that reference. Perhaps Alec can help me here. Um, that would be 18300093. 
it's there on the screen in front of you, 18, item P, uh, IV, Roman numeral four. And then really the only optional updates are um, regarding prohibiting storage of hazardous materials in the in flood, flood hazard areas. And those come from the Washington model ordinance. Um, and those, I think if we go to the next page, Yeah, under optional updates there, if you can scroll down just a little bit. Um, so though that deals, as you can see there on the screen with prohibiting storage of processing of hazardous materials, things that are, would be injurious, injurious to humans, animal or plant life uh, in the frequently flooded hazard area, special flood hazard area. Um, and then permitting storage of other material or equipment if it is not subject to damage by flood and if firmly anchored or um, if anchored to prevent rotate flotation, I think is what that should say, not rotation. <laughs> um, so those are kind of the only, well, actually, and then that last one um, about conditional letter of uh, map revision. Um, if developing within the floodway, that's and that's basically the formal process for amending FEMA maps, um, and that's an optional update as well. But whether whether or not that's included in the ordinance, if somebody develops in the floodway, they'd be required to go through a, a CLOMAR, as it's called, conditional letter of map revision, um, as I understand it. So. Those, those last three items there are really kind of the only optional updates. So um, that's kind of it. Um, everything, 90 plus percent of this is about required updates under the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, the city's obligated to update its ordinance to meet those requirements so that, um, so that FEMA can continue offering flood insurance to homeowners and businesses that are located in the floodplain either now or or in the future. Um, so I'll open it up to any more questions that you have and um, uh, for myself or Suzanne. Ethan, Ethan uh, uh, Dennis here. Dennis. Mm -hmm. At this point, do we have uh, uh, developers who, in fact, have wanting wanted to build on the uh, floodplain areas, and then and we've we've turned them down or whatever. Do we have any history of of someone in the, within the center city limits? Um, to do that? I'm not aware of any of that history at this point. I mean, I think since I've been at the city, I don't I don't know in, about any flood plane permits that have been issued, at least certainly from private development. Brian, I don't know if there's any public works projects that have happened like the um, East 4th Street project. I know that a portion of that's within the Breezy Creek floodplain, but that was probably permitted and done before the recent map updates that will take effect in November. Yeah. So I don't know if you can speak to And that structure is uh, going in, a, you know, at above flood elevations, um, replacing the culvert that, that we were talking about earlier that's, you know, would be inundated. So, yeah, public works projects are the only ones, you know, that I can think of that would potentially be building in these areas. Um, I can't think of any development projects that have been proposed that would be impacted by any of the flood mapping, let alone the, the changes that are proposed here. Well, since you, you know, you already indicated that the vast majority of this code is all pretty well dictated by the state um, and FEMA and all the above. Um, I would I, I asked that question because if we have had someone trying to, in fact, build within the flood areas, critical areas, <clears throat> and we had an issue, 
with that or had to deal with that, uh, I would think that we want to discuss that and make sure that we have made some adjustments to the code, whoever to, to either solve that going forward. But it doesn't sound like at this point we have any history of someone trying to do this. So, so pretty much wait. We're kind of wait and see if somebody wants to do something. Hopefully, we'll have the code that they must follow. And it doesn't sound like that we're going to have really any special code in there on behalf of the center. Is that correct? I don't see at this point. It doesn't yeah, sound these like Right. These are all national standards and in general developers are fairly familiar with them and they know that they have to, um, you know, for instance, if they develop in the floodplain that they have to elevate the structures at least one foot above the base flood elevation in order to develop in those areas. And so, um, uh, you know, whether, whether or not they've done that in the center or, um, you know, if they've done it in other places, they would generally be familiar with that, but because of the way the centers developed over time, there aren't a lot of um, there isn't a lot of existing development or structures in the in the special flood hazard area. Thank you. Yeah, Ethan, this is Dennis um, on page uh, on the definitions. Um, definition. Uh, the floodplain definition, the new 31 is uh, floodplain or flood prone areas, which appears to be a Washington mandated definition, seems to <clears throat> take the place of what we called a floodway fringe. And so I'm wondering if floodway fringe ought to go away and the two places that's used in the code be updated to floodplain. Um, so this is, yeah, okay. So I don't know, Suzanne, if you can answer that question better than I can, but um, I think my understanding was that the term floodway fringe is really the equivalent of floodplain now. Is that? Yeah. yeah, it is. Floodway fringe is a term that is not defined by the Code of Federal Regulations, and it's not used by um, FEMA in any of, of its uh, documentation. It is a term that does describe the area that is adjacent to the floodway that is flood prone, um, and it has been used in older um, documents, uh, not necessarily from FEMA, but older training documents through like the Association of State Floodplain Management uh, conferences and that sort of thing. But it does mean the same thing. Um, earlier, somebody asked if 1% floodplain, 100 year base flood, special flood hazard area, frequently flooded, and floodway fringe, those are all the same thing. Those are all the same thing. And in fact, um, uh, even though floodplain does have a different definition and special flood hazard area is what FEMA calls the area within the floodplain that is subject to the 1% storm. Um, that was just to identify that we have as our focus uh, for our regulations is the 1% chance storm. There are larger and smaller storms that we don't regulate to and those could also be considered floodplain because those are areas of inundation, but they are not ones that we regulate. So that's why we said the special flood hazard area is the 1% chance floodplain. And we use that term so frequently when we're talking about our regulations that when people say floodplain, that's generally what is being referenced as the 1% chance floodplain. But that is the same thing as the floodway fringe and it's the same thing as the base flood floodplain and um, uh, frequently flooded apparently how La Center uses it. And, and it's important, yeah, because Washington does have the critical areas ordinance and they use frequently fl flooded areas and in other parts and uh, other uh, communities within Washington, frequently flooded and special flood hazard area are not one and the same thing um, because of the 
nature of that community or, or the hazards in that community. So that was the only reason why we had this kind of separated here. It's frequently flooded as part of the critical areas ordinance in the state of Washington, whereas special flood hazard area is what FEMA uses as terminology to define the areas that are uh, under the regulations of the Code of Federal Regulations. So, Ethan, I guess I, what I do is challenge you to make sure we don't need conflicting terms or different terms for the same thing in here to confuse people. If, if floodway True. fringe is not a term we should be using, let's get rid of it. And yep. uh, and I I don't see where special flood hazard area is defined. Um, it is in there. It's I think we maybe defined that at in the beginning of 18, 30, and following that. Oh, no, it's, it's where I was looking. Oh, 40. Anyway, I, I don't see it in the definition section. We ought to be consistent. If we're using that term, it ought to be defined in our definition section. And then the other well, one. Well, I agree with you. I think we should define that one specifically, but the important point is that frequently flooded areas are equivalent to the special flood hazard area in the center. Then let's say that or get rid of yeah. one. Well, area, um, area of special flood hazard is defined. Um, it's might not be shown here because it's not one that we were changing, but area of special flood hazard is in the definition section and it does mean the land in the floodplain within a community subject to one percent or greater chance of flooding in any given year it, technically greater chance of flooding is yeah. is not accurate it's the one percent chance of flooding in any given year yeah, um, I, I do And then base flood is also in there, meaning the flood having a one percent chance of being equal. So both of those have been defined. I don't. Yep. So the, the base flood is basically an elevation. It inundates an area that it makes up the special hazard area. Base is 1%, yes. But the, the, that, that base level, that base flood, 1%, yeah. but it's, a, it's an elevation that defines the special hazard area. Base flood, uh, base flood is the 1% chance flood. Base flood elevation is the height the water will go to above mean sea level. Yeah, and that's the level that inundates the special hazard area. Yes, the special flood hazard area is the term that we use to define the base flood area. Yes. Okay. Um, the other one was. We should take out or greater, Ethan. Go on. I'm sorry. The other one is in number 29, the floodway definition. There's a yes. designated height in there that I yes. don't find a definition for. That is uh, because the Code of Federal Regulation defines it that way uh, in section 59.1. Um, there are areas within the United States that were regulating to or had their floodway designed to a different standard than one foot and most everybody has it as one foot but um, because this is a national definition and not everybody was one foot we had to change that to a designated height so any community that wants to go at a higher standard than what the minimum standards are from the federal regulations uh, we encourage that and this allowed them to by defining it this way uh, rather than saying one foot and sticking everybody with that one foot standard um well, I, might have in, it, but I, don't, I don't see the designate the definition for designated height um what we did was when you it's a one-dimensional model and, and we're treating water as a prism so we see how much water is coming down a channel and in this cross-sectional area, which is just a pie slice, so where we can see, like as if we were looking at the channel upstream, and it's got, and it's overbanks, and the channel, and we have the water from the 1% chance flow going through this cross-sectional area, and it stops at the elevation on the topo, on the topographic map, where 
we said, or where our models said, the height of water is going to reach to. So mm -hmm. that is the floodplain. And what we did to do a floodway is we squeezed that floodplain until we saw one foot rise in that water surface elevation somewhere mm -hmm. along the reach of that floodplain that we had mapped. Once there was a one foot mark somewhere on that reach, we stopped squeezing the floodplain and said, okay, this is the floodway. We just connected the dots and said, this is the floodway and said, no more development is allowed because any more development will increase, potentially increase the water surface elevation of the base flood more than one foot along this reach. Um, we said floodway and the definition, a designated height because some communities were less than one foot um, on their delineation of the floodway. Um, so to accommodate everybody in the nation, we made the floodway just say a designated height. It, in Washington, that designated height is one foot. But that just means how we defined what the floodway area is of a floodplain. That is not, um, it doesn't mean that water's only one foot deep or anything like that there. It just means that that's where we decided to stop squeezing a floodplain. And so this is an area that has to be reserved for the passage of water. No, I, I think I can understand all that. When I read this definition, I come to the word mm -hmm. desert height and I question mm -hmm. what is that and I go try to find a definition for it and I don't find it. So I find oh, the this, designated height. Yeah. I find it incomplete because you haven't defined what designated height means. I, I think that's being left to us possibly. Well then oh, then let's define it. Uh when there's a word in the code of federal regulations we prefer uh, or phrase the standard is to use the language from the Code of Federal Regulations for that definition. And because it does say a designated height in the Code of Federal Regulations, that's why we're asking for it to be designated height and floodway. Um, I don't have a problem if the center wants to go ahead and say in Washington or in La Center, that designated height is equal to one foot and that would be fine, but we can't change a designated height to say something different. Um, if you would like to go ahead and do that, uh, Ethan, I don't have any problem if you want to add that in there. Okay. Yeah, we because... might add a sentence to the end of that one there. Okay. And then my my last question was there was a um, a severability clause added, and I I was surprised because I thought we had an overall severability uh, condition on all of our code. You, and you may. I had added that in there because I didn't see it in what I was reviewing. And I did make a note, a uh, comment that it could be somewhere else in the Lemonis, Lost Centers Municipal Code, which is fine. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that somewhere they talked about severability, which more than likely most codes do have that already. But I just wanted to make sure that they would look for it somewhere else. Okay. It doesn't have to be added here. Okay, anything else? I think we're good. Okay, thank you again and appreciate your time tonight to discuss this topic, which was new for you, and um, appreciate your understanding on the quick schedule needed here to get this one done. Um, certainly, if you come up with any other questions, please. Feel free to email those um, to staff and we'll get those answered for you, hopefully for the public hearing next month. Um, but we could also answer questions um, during the public hearing. It's all for me. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, You're very Ethan, welcome. You... Thank you. Ethan, are you going to stay Thank on you, or you? I'm exiting, uh, and Alec is Alec is going to take the meeting from from here. But um, certainly, if well, just, there's any other, just a question for you. I, I know I yeah. got a 
invite to uh, some working groups that apparently never materialized. Are we still planning to do that? We're going to discuss yeah. that in business. Okay. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Still planning to move forward with those. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you again. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Any for, further thank questions you. for me? Or if not, I'll go ahead and log off too. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Oh, no, I think thank we're... you for the invite. Bye bye. All right. Let me ask Alec uh, on this. Uh, prior to our next meeting, are we going to get a, uh, something sent to us uh, that shows us the uh, latest uh, revisions to the code for us to take a look at? Shows what you've changed and what, what's gone yeah, away. Yeah, we can. Um... I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of updates, just what we talked about with not Dennis, not Brock on. Um, the biggest thing will be, we'll, we will have a packet for you to review at least a week prior to that hearing, because we have to publish all that information out for the public. Um, so you at least get a week prior to review that information. Um, maybe we can get that to you sooner, but it depends on our timeline. So it's going to show, it's going to show what the, uh, uh, the changes are uh, as a, to address the, requirements of the state yes and uh and, and if there are any from uh, uh changes that affect uh, that we put into place at, uh within the center yes we'll see that as well. yeah and i can um outline in our staff report showing what we've changed from now until then as well based upon your recommendations in our conversation today as well so Let we'll outline just, that as for, well for for me personally again everybody kind of works a different i like to see the code and then have you mark on that code, either yellow or red or whatever, yeah. that says that goes away and it's been replaced by this. You know, so trying to take two documents and somehow put them, mirror them together, my brain gets <laughs> meshy. Uh, that helps me to take a look at it and read through it and say, okay, that makes sense. You know, or, the, or if I see something that you've replaced and it doesn't make sense, I can make a note that says, I need an explanation of that. Yes. Trying to take two documents and say, well, here's what we're doing and here's what we've done. And, you know, it, 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 I, need, I need to be walked through a little bit better. Yeah, and I see your point. And we've been doing with the other code updates, highlighting where we've been making those edits. Um, this one was a working document that yeah. we've attached. And unfortunately, with that, didn't happen. So we can make sure yeah, with our that's, next. And that's good. Yeah. Thank you. You know, just uh, this might be my soapbox, but you know, anytime we go in and start changing definitions, and I understand we got some state mandate, mandated definitions we need to include. We need to be looking at all the definitions and make sure that we're not getting duplicative terms or like floodway or what was it, um, floodplain versus floodway fringe. All that does is confuse our code. So we need to be looking at those and making judgments about, okay, that definition really is this new one. Let's get rid of it and make sure we're updating it. Like Fringeway is used two, play, two other places in the code, in that critical areas code, that would need to be updated. So I, I would just encourage us to make sure we're doing that kind of review so we don't get this mess of definitions that conflict and just confuse people. Thank you. I, I agree with that as well. And our conversation with Suzanne was pretty valuable on that because she did provide all that and yeah. we're working it. It just kind of seemed similar, but maybe not. So I wasn't sure. And I didn't want to mess with it too much because mm -hmm. it is FEMA. Um, but she did verify that for us. So we'll make sure and go ahead and make those. You know, the other decisions. thing we've been trying to do is to move all the definitions into the definition section. Is there some reason we're leaving these in 18300? The overall goal is to move that to 1840 um, with the definitions there, um, but it's we're doing other changes with the critical areas update, ordinance update as well, as well as tethering all this FEMA update as, with it. So I think the end goal is to make those changes in 18330 as of now, and then once we get that done, we'll just yeah, move I, it over. I, I would agree. It probably makes so, sense. But there's just so many moving definitions right now yeah. between all the updates we're doing right now. We're trying to keep things where they're at for now, and then we'll do that big swap once it's all okay. done. Well, there's 80, 
86 definitions. <laughs> We're adding more. You know. Just here. And do we need them all? 86 definitions just for this quote. Wow. Wow. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? All right. I think we can probably uh, wrap this special meeting then. So I thought they were doing what you were asking. They had strike if out there are, uh, is that not I think we should probably have a motion to uh, uh, close the special meeting. I wonder whether or not we're going to get up. We probably don't need to. We're, we're done with the most current. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's go ahead and close the special yeah. meeting. And uh, current. we get a five minute break, six minute break. Sorry.
to get a prompt exit to. <laughs> so um, it is 6.30. I'm going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. And if you guys could kindly join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Label. There's one week you didn't do it. I, I thought something was missing. I thought, yeah. I thought we didn't <laughs> do it properly. Uh, Jess, can you give me a hand with the roll call, please? Planning Commissioner Alcosheri? Present. Planning Commissioner Smith? Uh, absent, excused. Planning Commissioner Hill? Here. Planning Commissioner Nutbrock? Here. Planning Commissioner Keeler? Here. And Planning Commissioner Alternate Jones? Uh, absent, excused. All right. At this time, I would entertain a motion for the approval of our June thirteenth um, meeting minutes. So moved. Uh, second. We've got a move in a second. Any discussion on last month's planning commissioning uh, minutes? Meeting minutes. Hearing no discussion. All those in favor of approving them, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries, or the approval carries. Jess, did we have any public comment come in via email, voicemail? All right. Um, are there any uh, members in the audience that would make like to make a public comment? You get a three-minute limit if you want. Okay. All right, moving on. We, we don't have a public hearing this month, hopefully next month, though. And so we'll just go ahead and dive into unfinished business, and that is the annual comprehensive plan update, which is just a small thing. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, it is a fairly small thing compared to the periodic comprehensive plan update. So this year we're talking about a annual comprehensive plan update, which um, for the GMA and LCMC 18120, these are um, annual comp plan updates the cities the city can do once a year. So typically, there could be multiple properties or concurrently reviewed under one um, review process, and then that's only done once a year. And that's <coughs> what we're doing here, um, and that is in order to review the cumulative effects that can be determined from all these proposed comprehensive plan amendments and zoning changes. Um, so tonight there's a proposal for seven parcels under five different owners for comprehensive plan changes and out of the total seven, four of these will include zone changes. So that means five of them is only a comprehensive plan designation change, whereas the other four are a comp plan, am comp plan amendment change and a zoning change together. Um, so I'll go through each one of those with you later. Um, so comprehensive plan and zoning map change are considered type four actions. Um, these require one or more public hearings with the planning commission and one or more public hearings with the city council. The planning commission will make a recommendation, recommendation to the city council and the city council will make a final decision on this. Um, in the staff report, um, there's an error about the appeals process. So I just wanna go over that briefly to clarify that. Since this is a type four decision, appeals cannot go to the city council or to the city for review that actually has to go to court um, and that's for any type four process so like zone change amendments um, code amendments and so on and so forth so that there's some language in there um, i believe the staff reports it's a draft so there's some template information in there that was carried over um, so we'll it's a working document and we'll correct those errors including the appeals so i just want to point that out um, before I get too much further. So let, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. So we're doing two things here. We're making zone changes and we're making an update to the comp plan. Mm -hmm. Are both of those type four? Yes, those are both type four processes. And um, we're just linking them together because um, basically all the zone changes are tethered to a comp plan amendment change. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so the city is the applicant for the proposal, although most of the properties are not owned by the city. 
Um, the city has done an re internal review of comp plan designations and zoning designations and identified where map mismatches have occurred when existing conditions or owner plans for development don't match what's actually um, in our published zoning map and comprehensive plan map. Um, so the city has reached out to property owners and asked if they'd like the city to initiate a comp plan designation change during the annual review process that we're doing now. Um, of the original properties we've contacted, seven decided to move forward with the process, and um, two of these include the city. And I'll go over those. Um, so um, if you go to table one in the um, agenda packet, I believe that's on page 75. Um, it shows all seven properties that we are um, proposing these updates to. Um, and as you can see here, like the bottom two are the city of the center and the rest are private property that are owned by um, throughout the city. Um, you have a question? Yeah, so the, uh, the proposed des designation, the, the CMU, that, that's not a designation in our comp plan. We got CMX. Is there some reason we're not using the comp plan designation? Commissioner Nutbrock, that is a good question. Um, it, if that's true, that's the designation we should be using, and I believe you are correct. Um, I wasn't the one that uh, wrote the staff report. Another planner at WSP that's a little less familiar with the center um, drafted this up, so I can make that correction in this and make sure that's consistent. I wasn't sure if you were going to CM. <laughs> new plan, but yeah. the CMX is what's in there. Yeah, company. and he actually asked me about that earlier, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it's MX, and so he forgot where, why he asked that question, and that's why. <laughs> so it should be MX. Okay. Um, so here again, there's these seven properties. Um, the largest of them, of them is 11.5 acres. Um, the smallest is 0.11 acres. Um, so generally, we're seeing under about 20 acres of total um, comp plan amendment changes. So I want to go over each property that we're discussing. So if we skip to page 92 of the agenda packet, we'll kind of go through each property and what what's kind of going on in this area um, and why we are making these changes. So these three properties, the largest of the three, um, is a uh, it's the Advanced Builders Project. It's a fourplex that's under site plan review right now. Um, the existing zoning is residential professional, which that doesn't align with the comp plan designation. So this is simply a map change to correct that map mapping issue. So they are redesignating to um, commercial mixed use to align with the existing zoning on the property, just to um, correct that mistake. Um, and then the top two properties, and for reference where this is in, in La Center, it's in downtown, just uh, behind um, the Palace and Chips Casino. And then the top two properties, um, they're the same owner. Um, What's the plan to go in there? The the larger property there? These, these here? The, so the larger property there, it's a site, it's currently under a site plan review for a fourplex. Okay. Um, we've, I believe, issued completeness and they just haven't come back to us for several months. We've issued incompleteness and they haven't returned back to us for a while. Um, I think it's been three or four months, so it's been pretty quiet, um, but they are in that review process. And, and this, the other two? And the other two, they're currently, I think, two duplex duplexes that are pretty old, um, and so they might be intending to redevelop it. Um, but since they are currently deep duplexes, the current zoning is LDR, I believe, LDR 7.5. And so I'll show later they're planning to rezone to RP, which aligns more with the duplexes on site because it's pretty dense because it's such a small lot with two dwellings on that lot, each of those lots. So they're planning to redesignate their comp plan to um, commercial mixed use and change their zoning to RP, which is pretty similar to everything else to the north east and south of that area. I think this property has been on the books for a couple of years. I mean, this process, it's not new. It's not new. I mean, okay. I'm trying to get finalized is new, but it's been percolating for, I think, a couple of years. <clears throat> They're probably trying to save their money up, I guess. 
So that's our first three properties. The next property, um, I believe, is um, so this property is just south of um, the La Center Elementary School. So the majority of this property is actually outside the La Center UGA. If you can see, there's like blue dotted line that's going across horizontally. That's the UGA. And so there's a little sliver just, in, um, I believe that would be just east of the UGA or north, north of the UGA. Um, that little sliver up there was didn't have a city comp plan designation or zoning. So typically UGAs don't cut through properties like this. So somehow during that process, there was a mapping error. So we're just trying to catch that mapping error and provide that little sliver with a comp plan designation of public facility or open space. And the same thing for zoning as parks and open space. So the remainder, the larger portion of that property will, will remain with the county and it does have a county, county comp plan designation and zoning. Um, however, um, we're just giving the correction for that small piece here for city designation and zoning. Which item was that on the on your on your uh, fourth? Oh, fourth item. Fourth, yes. Okay. So why why not correct the mapping error and take that little sliver and put it outside the UGA? I believe the UGA amendment process is a whole different ball game, and so mm -hmm. this is what we're doing for now until. I believe once we get to the periodic comprehensive plan process, that's when we will reassess the UGA and we can probably at that time amend the boundary and we might be expanding it potentially as well. So we'll be dealing with that anyhow at that point. So this is a fix for now until we get to that larger issue down the road. And this, this property is pretty confusing. I didn't learn about this property until today um, to give this presentation tonight. And um, yeah, again, it was some sort of mapping error with the when the UGA was assigned. So what, what is P slash OS? Parks and open space. Isn't it UPOS? For the comp plan? No, for the zone. I don't think our I don't think we have a zone that's POS. I can't remember the top of my head. I don't I don't deal with that zone too often, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's parks and open space POS. Yeah. Oh it is? Yeah. Are there buildings on this properties? Um the the first three we saw um, or on this property, yeah. uh, I don't believe there are any buildings, correct, Jess? Uh, yeah, there's a house. Oh, there's a house. On which yeah. which piece? The the piece, the whole thing. The, the whole green? Thing. Yeah, the green area, yeah. There's a house on the green area? Yeah, there's a house. It's uh, not in the park that's in the UGA, UGA. Yeah. but there is their drive access in driveway uh, connects from Ivy and then goes over kind of in that little spot. So this is behind the uh, the, uh, the, middle, the elementary school. Correct. Uh, and to the west of Ivy then going over the creek. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And we also chose this designation as well because the county properties around it are all um, also parks designation as well, just been consistent with the area. That is the urban holding overlay. What's the, the what overlay? It's, it is the urban holding overlay. Urban. So that's in the UGA. That, that is in UGA. Oh, but correct. that's uh, count, Clark that's County what? Legacy Lands. Oh, Clark County Legacy Land. But it's also urban holding. Yeah, I guess that we're using <laughs> as a as part of the school. No, it's no, it's just yeah, Lake no. Lands property, I guess. I, I want one of these size monitors over there because I can actually <laughs> read it there. Yeah, it's easier to read here than there. Yeah, I guess. yeah. Uh, Planning Commission got the short end of the stick with that one, <laughs> but I, that's why I'm looking back this way. But it's a little bit bigger here. 
Are there any other questions on this okay, property? Okay, so just make sure I'm clear. So it, we're not changing. We're just changing that little teeny piece there to parks and open space. Yes. Yeah, and that's just consistent with this map only shows the city's zoning and comp plan. It doesn't show the counties. So right. the intent of the GIS mapper, mapper we worked with was just showing that the whole properties with the counties, <clears throat> parks and open space, they have a probably a different term than we use for the city. Yeah. And then just highlight all green just because it's showing that our our sliver in the city is consistent with the county's comp plan and zoning. Okay. Any other questions before I move on to the next property? Okay, go to the next property. Um, so this one is just south of Northwest Pacific Highway, um, southeast of Riverside Estates. Um, as you see here, there's um, a couple different comp plan designations going across it. It's public facility and open space and also um, urban residential. Um, I'll show you later, but the zoning on this property, or actually, um, we don't have a map for that, but um, the zoning across this, this entire property is MDR 16, so we're just correcting that mapping to be consistent with the current zoning of that property. Um, and that's that's all we're doing here. Again, um, since zoning is MDR 16 across the whole property, we are making it urban residential across the whole property just to be consistent. But but you're making it LDR 7.5, right? No, it's remaining MDR 16. Well, your your table says LDR 7.5. See. Oh, that's that's my area. Is that's correct? LDR 7.5. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Thank you. And then the next property, Jess, please to, I think it's the, yes. Um, so this is Riverside Park. Um, this has been recently transferred to the city from Riverside Estates as a city owned park. Um, so currently this property was MDR 16. That's where I got my confusion. Um, and now we're um, changing that to public facility and open space in the comprehensive plan, just because obviously it's a park. So we're just keeping that land use consistent with the comp plan designation. And then next property, please. And I believe this is the last one of the comp plan designations. So this is the property where the city hall, old city hall is located on. Um, there's been some, maybe some boundary changes made in the past where the zoning and the comp plan designations didn't match. So on that one property, we have some um, commercial mixed use designation and public facility and open space designation as well. Our intent here is just to um, keep this whole property as commercial mixed use consistent with um, the use of the property and also um, make it economically attractive as a commercial use in the future. What's the green area? It's public parks and open space. Yeah, public facility. Public open facility, space. open space. Okay, so that's where River, uh, Battle of Stonewall Park is down in there. Mm -hmm. No? Um, don't, some legacy lands, similar huh? parks to the southwest of that. Okay, southwest of there. Okay, it, it might help too in the packet. It's the PDF is page twenty eight. That way, the you can see the legend if yeah. you've got it on your yeah. on your computer. So the one outlined in red there is the old city hall property, mm -hmm. like right across the park right there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, but oh, that's okay. It's a little easier this way. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to see the legend on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> that's a weird piece of property. There we go. That's okay. That's, uh, <laughs> so if you're in the packet, page 28. Why, but it's vertical. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Try. Any questions on this property before we move on? Almost like an arrow here. And then, um, so this is zoning changes. So our first properties that I showed were the comp plan designations. So now I'm showing the zoning change. 
Um, so again, those are those two properties that have a duplexes currently on them. Um, currently they're zoned uh, LDR 7.5, but we are, um, the zone is gonna be changed to RP and it'll be consistent with the comp plan designation of commercial mixed use. And again, those are those two fairly old duplex duplexes that are currently there behind the casinos. And then um, to the next uh, map, this again is Riverside Park. Um, we're changing the zoning from uh, MDR 16 to parks and open space, um, again, making that consistent with the comprehensive plan designation, which was urban residential to um, public facilities and parks. The next map, please. Um, again, this is the old city hall. Um, the, there's a couple of zonings, zones on here. We're just bringing across um, it to be C1, the C1 zone across the whole property. Um, there's those green lines kind of going across. Um, that's the downtown overlay where they have to uh, follow downtown design guidelines. Um, this is actually a mapping error by our GIS team that um, overlay should go across the whole property. It doesn't show that, that here necessarily necessarily. So with the zoning change, that overlay will come with it as well. That's the light green area? It's like the light, it's those lines okay. going across the red, all the properties okay. in red. It's kind of hard to see on the, t the monitors here. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> well, those are open on color blind. Oh, yes, yeah. Any questions on this and property? That, pro that property will have the overlay on it also? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's just a mapping error by our mapping team not bringing the overlay across it, but that's the intent here. And then I think we have one more map to look at. Oh, that was it. Okay. Yes. Um, me. I think that piece is owned by the county that goes into space. The city parcel there, that long skinny one, sort of goes into where we're thinking. The city hall is on the west side, and then it kind of extends down into the green. The zoning here? No, to right the off, right. right off that the skinny green, green one. Oh, okay. Yeah, the skinny one. Yeah. Yeah, there's some of the zoning lines don't match the current property lines in that area, so it's just kind of wonky. Um, so we're just dealing with this property for now. It's a legacy land. Okay. So if we go back to um, the bottom of page 76 of the agenda packet, um, there's some approval criteria that's listed by LCMC 18120050 when we are um, approving or going through uh, the review process on annual comp plan updates. Um, so the first of these is that uh, the comp plan amendment changes and zoning changes have to be consistent with federal and state law. Um, these have to be consistent with listener comprehensive plan policies. Um, it can't result in a decrease in level of service for capital facilities and services. Um, must be consistent with the 2016 through 2035 listener comprehensive plan population projections. Um, and we did an internal analysis with that. Um, there's actually a net increase of uh, residential lands resulting from these comp plan and zoning changes. Um, and um, so there's, we are remaining consistent with that criteria. Um, another criteria is that this has to be in public interest. Since this is correcting mapping errors, 
and in order to maintain and reflect current city policies and land use decisions, it is in the public interest to do these changes. Um, another criteria is that it must meet locational criteria for the proposed zoning changes. However, this criterion does not apply as the proposed zone changes do not have locational criteria. Um, so the zones that we're moving to or changing to don't have any locational criteria listed. So again, that criteria doesn't apply in this case, if that makes any sense. So like, for example, some zones will say, um, like in bigger cities, like they'll have like a mixed use urban density, like high density or mixed use. And like they'll say it has to be located along like um, areas of public transit. And that's the only area like that zone could be allowed. Um, we don't have much of anything like that, obviously in the center or other examples. Um, so again, like the zones we are proposing the zone changes to don't have criteria like that. Um, also, you have to demonstrate the conditions have substantially changed since current zoning was applied to the property. Um, again, we identified due to inconsistencies between the comp plan designation and land use or comp plan and zoning, or to reflect current development of the property, um, we need to make these changes. For example, um, for Riverside Park, um, the park was under MDR 16 zoning, became a park. It's a substantial change since the zoning map was um, implemented, so therefore we have to make this change to be consistent with the existing land use on the property. And then lastly, um, the proposed zoning is allowed by the comp plan to the zone matrix. Sorry, the proposed zoning is allowed by the comp plan zone matrix adopted by the city council. Um, if you go to page 80, figure one of the packet, um, this is the adopted matrix. So again, this shows the comp plan designations and then um, the zoning, the zones that correspond to those comp plan designations. So um, with our proposed changes, we're showing that um, our zonings and comp comprehensive planned um, designations are consistent with each other. So are these coming back to us next month for public uh, for uh, public hearing? Yes, that's our our uh, scheduled timeline is to bring this back to you next month for a public hearing. And then and then the following month possibly going to this, uh, council. Yeah, possibly to the city council. We might be doing a, a workshop on this as well as city council um, prior to it going to public hearing with the city council. On, on all five of these or all seven properties. Seven of these pieces of property. Yes. Okay. But they're all under one application, right. so to speak. Yes. Understand. All right. Um, and then we still haven't had any public notice on these yet. That'll be done prior to the public hearing we'll have next month with Planning Commission. So we don't have any public comments at this time. Um, and at this time, staff staff is recommending approval. Again, Planning Commission will provide a recommendation at the hearing to forward to City Council next month. Um, and at that time, the Planning Commission can continue the hearing once we have that hearing, can recommend against or in favor of the proposal with or without certain changes and submit those recommendations to City Council. Brian, a question for you <clears throat> on all these seven pieces. Uh, you anticipate uh, some pushback on some of this? No, we've worked with these individual property owners to make sure that they're on board with the proposed changes. There was, I think, a couple others that we were considering and didn't either didn't get feedback from the property owners or received negative feedback. I think we just didn't hear from them, yeah. so we pulled those so, out. So, no, as far as you know, at this point, no surprises. It should, it should just. Yeah, just pretty typical cleanup sort of stuff, and and we've reached out and educated and informed the property owners that are impacted. Do you anticipate some property owners showing up and and uh, and uh, participating in public hearing? Potentially, but not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> okay. Is there a is there a notification required of adjacent property owners for a type four? 
I believe there isn't. No, I, don't, um, I don't think there is. There is for type two and type threes, but for type four, there is not. There's just only <coughs> a public noticing requirement, but not directly to the adjacent property owners. <coughs> and then I had one comment on page six of the staff report. I don't know what. Yeah, right, right there. Keep going. I'm sorry. Page. Yeah, page six. Mark one more. Okay, the last, the, the second line from the bottom there says one of the four parcels change from such and such, <coughs> which would create an area of possible residential uses. Um, given that that property is mostly vertical over here, I, I think it's a stretch to think that would create some residential uses. Yeah, commercial. Yeah, that probably should say commercial uses. I mean, if you look at C1, commercial residential mixed use is allowed, but I don't yeah. know if that's what you were thinking. You've, you've got yeah, I've, over I think half of that up. is not buildable because of either the buffer or the, the yeah. slope. No, I agree with that. Um, so that's that's probably a typo, and we'll we'll correct that for the public hearing. Again, this is a draft form, and there were some errors that I noticed when I reviewed this today as well. Good. Anything else? Any questions? I don't. I think so we're, you need nothing it? formal from us now, yep. since this was just draft. Yep. Next next meeting we would have a formal formal public hearing. Yep. Okay. Do you expect do you anticipate us receiving anything different than what we're seeing here uh, for the next uh, meet prior to the next meeting? No, there will be some minor updates to the staff report those errors that I talked about. Um, and other than that, there shouldn't be anything okay. new coming yeah. across. Thank yep. you. All right. We're good on that. Thanks. Uh, that was a lot to, uh, <laughs> that, that was a lot, but you did a, a good job of condensing yeah. it and making it very clear. So as usual, thank you, Al. Yep. Um, all right. Are we ready to move on? I think so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to roll into new business. So I'm going to go ahead and inject a piece of business if there's uh, no objection. Um, work groups. Wanted to see, Jess, can I get your hand with this? And I know we don't have everyone here, but um, I was in a work group with uh, Commissioner uh, Jones. We we discussed the, I think it was like the setbacks. Thank you. And so we have a couple of other topics. And so, and, and I know we're, city email is not like the easiest to get in and out of. I've, I've finally gotten it down to a science, but um, just there was like two or three different work groups. Did you want to just maybe throw out a couple right. of the names? So um, for critical areas, we were wanting to meet twice. Uh, generally, I think we were saying maybe two different groups. So, you know, we're not having one group go over critical areas, which can kind of be a lot. Um, so I need volunteers for two of those. And then MDR 16 density code, uh, we need a work group and that would just be meeting once uh, before another like full planning commission meeting. Um, so maybe if we can at least get some volunteers and feel free to be on both, I suppose, since there's only four of you today. Um, and then I guess I'll just send out some times and maybe we could just call. Yeah, and I and, and you had sent me that note to text, and I was no, you're I, fine. I wasn't on top of the texting. So. <laughs> Jesse, are you talking? Are these the meetings in person, this or are, is, they, uh, are, are they? I guess whatever works for people. Uh, the work group could be in person or virtual. I can run it hybrid. I have no issue with either. Me and Brian will be here in person regardless. So we we did ours virtually. Okay, yeah, are you, so you, are you talking about us uh, looking at a code and? And updating, looking at it for potential updates. 
Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, so it's the critical areas code that we've been going over and the MDR 16 density code, but a work group to be a little more um, in depth to spend an hour on it with two planning commissioners. Yeah, who's who's the leader on this? It would be um, Ethan and or Alex. Okay. We yeah, already volunteered for the MDR 16. Okay. Well, put me down for the critical areas, and I'll, I'll I'll work on that with somebody. Maybe. Um, yeah, we had a we had the roster, and I and I didn't bring that notebook. I switched notebooks. Um, yeah, I do remember uh, Commissioner Uprock being on critical areas, and I think it was critical MDR sixteen. MDR sixteen, and then I thought we had someone with you, but I could I could send you the list. I I think or we uh, volunteered. Uh, Smith, but he's not here. So. Yeah, yeah, we, we volunteered. There was a couple people missing. We just put them on, and then they were like proposed groups. And then we, yeah. Anyway, we'll. Uh, so we at least have Commissioner Uprock on uh, MDR, and then uh, my preference would be to do that one. And then uh, Dennis, uh, Commissioner Hill could be on critical area like Group One, maybe. Anyone want to jump on? With either one, you want to do with critical, areas. critical area of group one? Sure. Okay, so we have uh, Commissioner Keeler there. Why do we need two groups? It was just too. Uh, it was a lot of material, and we were just spreading the the joy. We didn't want to hog all the fun. So yeah, if that's kind if of that's, two big portions. Right. <laughs> so there's a critical areas point one, and another critical areas point two. So at this point, we don't have anybody for point two. And we don't know what point one or point two represents, do we? Okay. Well, I think the the group one's probably going to be the wetland stuff we're updating, the buffers associated with wetlands, and then group two is going to be that site potential tree height item about um, riparian area buffers. Um, so I think that's the idea. It's, those are two big updates. I mean, there's a lot of other updates going on the critical areas ordinance update, but I think those are our two Just to main topics. Well, and buffers, any particular buffers? There's the buffer thing, there's also the trees and all that stuff. So, uh, point one for you and I then? Sure. Okay. All right. So, so we got the for, uh, critical areas work group one, uh, Keeler and Hill, and then MDR 16, uh, Commissioner Nutbrock, and we'll find someone. Uh, I could help you recruit. I think Ethan had warned me about uh, like a serial looped quorum and email and so I was but I could text one on one maybe or email one on one too. So my goal is to, to maybe get our critical areas two group so I could talk to uh let me work on that offline. Yeah I, if, if you want to get the volunteers for now I will set up a meeting for critical areas group one. Okay. I'll set the times with uh, the both of you in conjunction with staff and then um, if you want to get someone to join uh, Dennis, Netbrock, and then that group two. And if I can't get someone for MDR 16 I'll, I'll work on it with you. If, I'm, if I can be on two which there's no rules. I don't, so. yeah. And yeah. I was going to say if, if you need somebody for that in the critical areas I I'd be more happy to do it. Okay. My, my interest right now is the MDR. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll do MDR 16 with Commissioner and not Brock if no one jumps at it. And then the rest I'll just coordinate offline. Perfect. All right. Any any other uh, anyone else want to add anything to this? Any new business someone wants to bring forward? All right. Well, uh, let's roll into reports then. If you guys uh, can give me a hand, the community development staff report. If you guys want to fight over it, that's fine. Okay, I'll be presenting on the community development report. Um, so I think the first one we could probably talk about is Stevens Hillside. Um, I believe tomorrow night the hear public hearing will be for the development agreement with the city council, um, and that's associated with the final plat. Um, and again, that what was that? Number 13, is that what that is? It is number 13. And again, that development agreement is so they can increase their maximum impervious surface area and maximum lot coverage area um, because of um, 
largely due to the lot size and the slopes and the housing products that they want to provide on those. Um, and then again, that's kind of what spurred our front setback um, code update. So they have that front setback of code update that they're waiting on, um, a final plot that's under review, the D development agreement, and I believe that's it for now. Um, so that application is and development is getting closer to the finish line, but there's still a lot of work left on that. Um, so for the setbacks, weren't they seeking a variance? They were seeking a variance. They had to. So they pulled that. They withdraw to. Um, they were seeking a variance that was so wide ranging that it did no longer met the criteria of a variance. Great. So we asked them to withdraw that application, and then are exploring the the code change to the front setbacks. So, so who's the review board? The review board. With them to look over what these what they're recommend what they're asking for. So the development agreement is before it will go before the council for consideration, and that's again, as Alex said, in particularly related to the uh, impervious and building lot coverage. Um, and there's stipulations on how many lots can exceed, you know, it's a percentage of the overall development. Um, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it was like 40%, 40 40 percent or something. Yeah, yeah. something like that. For, for building area, and I think it was like 25 for impervious, I want to say. Yeah, something that sounds like right. That. And then yeah. in exchange, the, you know, the offsetting benefit is that they're providing some additional trail easements for a future connection down to the south that matches with our new proposed parks plan that's still in the works. Um, and then they were providing some additional open space with benches and dog way stations and the like to, to offset basically the, the reduction to what would otherwise be backyards by these larger lots. Is there, is there going to be a public hearing on this? There is a public hearing tomorrow at City Council. And then the um, code change, this front setback, obviously we're talking about that. That's We've workshopped that, so that'll be coming back to you with the workshop. Uh, changes next month, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully We next plan month. on it, yeah. Um, and then the final plat is sort of on its own timeline, and that's, um, I think, ready to move forward here. I can't remember exactly. Jess, do you remember if there's something outstanding on final plat? I think there's just some minor comments going back and yeah, forth Yeah, I think we're it. finishing the review. I don't know if Valerie added the... Uh, right I away. think she did. The right yeah. away. Uh, and then we're just waiting to see if the DA gets approved. Yeah, but the plat can move forward regardless of the, you know, if the, if the DA doesn't go through, then they have to meet the code building lot area or right. building lot coverage. And if the code change doesn't go through, then they have to meet standard setbacks. So, Ryan, have, have we made a, a handshake with them on on, on what's going, what we're going forward with? Or do you anticipate some pushback? Uh, uh, tomorrow at, uh, at it's going to be during the workshop or during a regular council meeting during regular council meeting so you, public you hearing. Push, anticipate some pushback from them or, or is there a pretty much a handshake on i forward? don't anticipate any pushback from them i mean we'll see if there's any public comment i mean i think the the original intent behind all this is so that they can offer a, a single story product that otherwise would exceed lot coverage and or setbacks on some of those lots and you know, the benefit that they're, you know, advertising for that is that it, you know, it, uh, older population prefers that and allows folks to age in place versus a more traditional multi-level product that would otherwise fit on those lots. So, um, you know, our conversation with them has been through, for the development agreement and the impervious lot coverage and building lot coverage is, you know, our code requires a higher than standard or a lower than typical building footprint compared to other you know, jurisdictions, Ridgefield or, or the county, because we wanted to make sure that people have that recreational opportunity in their backyard. So if you're increasing your building size, then you need to be offsetting that through other recreational amenities. So that's what they're proposing to do. Well, uh, I think I, I want to get on a bandwagon here at all, but I'm anticipating I'm probably going to say something tomorrow night. Okay. Just just the fact that going forward, we need to not let 
the contractor dictate to us what they want to they do after the fact they, they need to tell us what they want to do for up front from the very beginning not come in and say we're going to do this and come back and try to squeeze squeeze more things into what we've uh, signed up for so and i think you know obviously this project was uh preliminary plotted in a totally different configuration in 2018 i think it was um, but when it came back for the post-decision review, they did bring this up, I believe. And I think that these were sort of went beyond what we could do in in a land use hearing, you know. So, um, you know, it's, I don't think that they've necessarily been hiding the ball. Um, it's just that, you know, when the, the thing was replotted in the in new tradition, you know, it was the purchaser, they wanted to do something different than what was discussed. Well, the, the, I think the bottom the line is, for me, is when they developed that land, they didn't develop it based on our code. They said, our code says, says here's lot size, here's the setbacks. And so I think if they would have done that, they probably would have ended up with half a dozen less lops, perhaps. You know, I don't know what that number would represent. But if they would have said, oh, that's our requirement, okay, let's build, let's lay it out per, per city code. And I, if they would have done that, we wouldn't have, they wouldn't be going through all this process now. That's all I'm saying. I mean, potentially, but I think I would also note that our lot areas and, you know, that are spelled out in our code may not be conducive, especially when you have topography into the mix there to have um you know a single fam single level sort of style product so. yeah but they know all that they they, they built they, they carved that property out and made it look like what they wanted to yeah so i'm really sad i'm sorry I, I, if you're driving down uh, 405 i'm thinking uh or no i guess it's really five in south uh that's that, that's I'm sure that's Richfield. i'm not excuse me that's vancouver I just can't believe these houses that are going in that are just almost you could little well, cracker boxes really vertical. Yeah. yeah, and you could almost stand up or your hand out each window and shake hands with your neighbor and they're just box after box after box after box. And I'm going, we should probably take you know I, I this. we gotta we, we, we should gotta probably sure take this offline. We gotta be sure we don't let that happen here in the center. Well you're welcome to make a comment at the meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do we have any other, anything else on the report? I should see if Commissioner Nutbrock had a oh. comment. Oh, it looked okay. like he's getting ready to speak. <laughs> uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, so other items, um, we had, yes, we're not quite done. Um, we had a few um, temporary sales office permits come through the door. Um, and two of these are with DR Horton the developers at um, Riverside Estates and Highland Paris. So the Riverside would be 62 and Highland would be 63. Um, and so looks like uh, for the Riverside temporary sales office, we're getting pretty close to issuing our completeness and maybe a staff report pretty soon. Um, and then, and since 60, I think they're all three developed, correct, Jess? Well, the Riverside, the, offices. the Riverside one is Riverside is. It's been okay. used for months now. I'm surprised. Yeah, we followed up with them because yeah. they got the building permit, but they didn't get the temporary use. So oh, yeah. We, okay. There was several of them where we were like, hey, you missed a process here. Okay. And they've all done that or pulled the building permit, I believe, for, yeah. for Highland, Riverside, and all. Is that, is that true for, um, I just forget what the third one is. Um, Oh, oh Stevens Hillside. Yeah. Stevens Hillside, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, so we got all three of those applications um, working through those, and I believe these are the first we've used with the code as well, right? Issuing these permits. Yeah. Yeah. So um, putting that code to use, um, and I believe within the next few weeks, they all should be um, issued if they're in compliance, obviously. Um, and then we also got a sign permit application for the new Fortune Casino, which is replacing the Palace Casino. Um, they have a, two wall signs, one on the front, one on the back of the building, 
and then they're reusing the existing freestanding sign that says Palace Casino right now. They're going to reuse that. Um, and so we're reviewing that as well. Um, so how how is the staff reacting to their proposed lighting around the eaves? Um, that's a good question. You want to take that, Brian? I would think that violates our light outdoor lighting code. So their original proposal, I think, was for sort of a neon style. I think they're green and purple. Yeah, and so I think the comment based on the code was that that maybe didn't fit. I think the lighting is supposed to meet the architectural theme of the building or something like that. So we said that, you know, neon lighting on the on the casino there that's sort of a more classical style building didn't really fit maybe. So I think their current proposal is a little bit different. It's more like, it's individual light bulbs. Yeah, individual yeah, light like bulbs a soft in glow. A, yeah, yeah, in a row. I, so. I would question whether that meets the, the intent of our dark skies initiative. Yeah, I'm gonna guess it depends on if it's shielded above or not. Yeah, but I, if I, well, I don't recall. I won't speak it, it, off the top of my I, head on that one. Yeah, there's no information there about the, the lumens of each bulb, but I suspect that they are putting out a lot more lumens than is allowed in our dark than our outdoor lighting code. Yeah, and we'll take a closer look at that um, because obviously this is kind of something we typically, it's atypical for us to review. Um, and they also have some other issues with the proposed like wall signs because they're proposing upward facing lighting and it's it's required to be downward facing. And so there's, there's gonna be some changes that they're gonna have to implement. Um, and that was just with a preliminary high level review that there was some of these issues. So we're going to make sure that they are compliant with the code. And is that a new owner? Yes. I think so, oh. yes. And do they own also chips yes. next door as well? Yeah. So somebody bought the whole complex. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's really it. That's really moving along application wise in the center. Um, there's a couple other subdivisions that are getting close to the final plot process. I think some. Yeah, and, and number one, Lockwood, uh, whatever it is, Lockwood whatever, um, started construction here, um, grading and clearing. So if you drive out that way, you'll see equipment out there. Um, and then Ace is across the street. I think we're in. 37. And, yeah, number 37, I think we're anticipating we'll start relatively soon. I don't think they're quite done with their engineering review yet. You're talking about the port the lock. What's that? You're talking about across the street from the milk barn, that corner? No, across the street from the middle school out uh, oh, Lockwood. Oh, okay, up this way. Okay. Yeah. So is there, um, is there a pre-application meeting scheduled up for the Peterson development? Yes, thanks for the reminder on that. That, yeah, that um, was too late breaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have that pre-application meeting scheduled for the 26th, I believe. So a couple weeks out. Um, they're proposing 47 lots on like six and a half acres. And I believe 11 of them or 10 of them are attached single family. And then the remainder are single family detached um, because of that. With our MDR 16 code update, there's that product mixing requirement. If it's five acres or more, they have to have 75% be one product type and then 25% be another. So um, we're proposing with that code update to up that to 20 or get rid of it possibly. Um, so it's if that goes into play, if that code is updated before they apply, um, then they will have to be required to comply with that. Is there a time for that meeting? I think two o'clock. Yeah, we changed to two o'clock for pre-op meetings <laughs> per Ethan's request. Thank you. I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alec. I appreciate it. Um, let's go into uh, 2.10. Uh, any comments, Commissioner Nuprock? Uh, no, thank you. Commissioner Hill? No. I have. None other than thanks to staff for all the work you do, Commissioner Keeler. All right.
Um, and on 211, I kind of usurped that using the uh, new business. So we talked work sessions already. Um, so at this point, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I got a move in a second. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So that's